Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Thursday, January 11th, 2024. Professor Jeffrey Sachs joins us from Cambodia. That's Professor, you never astound me where you're going to pop up. Crystal clear and looking youthful as ever, but thank you very much for joining us here. Great, great to be with you. Greetings from Phnom Penh. Thank you. Professor uh, Sachs, as we speak, it's nine o'clock at night in Phnom Penh. It's nine in the morning here in New Jersey. It's three or four, forgive my ignorance, in the afternoon in Brussels. But as we speak, the uh, International Court of Justice of the United Nations is meeting uh, and hearing the complaint of South Africa versus uh, Israel alleging genocide. So first, how serious, how compelling, how um, uh, detailed is the complaint? Well, this is an absolutely astounding day, a, a historic day. Uh, South Africa has filed an application with the International Court of Justice. This is the UN's uh, global court in The Hague in the Netherlands, and uh, it uh, addresses disputes between governments. Uh, in this case, this is a dispute brought by South Africa claiming that Israel is uh, undertaking genocidal actions and with genocidal intent. And the legal basis for this uh, complaint, this application to the International Court of Justice is that both South Africa and Israel are parties to the 1948 Genocide Convention. And so this is uh, a uh, a complaint uh, that South Africa is making uh, that it is entitled to make uh, as a signatory to the Genocide Convention, which compels all of the signatory countries, including Israel, to abide by the terms of the Genocide Convention. It's stunning, uh, amazing to watch these proceedings. South Africa filed an extremely detailed application, 84 pages describing uh, both the intentionality of Israel in destroying Gaza, in making Gaza uninhabitable, and the actions of Israel in bombing uh, core infrastructure, uh, in uh, blocking the inflows of water, food, medicine, fuel, uh, that are basic necessities of life. And the combination of the statements by Israeli leaders, uh, from the prime minister and president through the cabinet to members of the Knesset to leaders of the uh, Israel Defense Forces, is a shocking uh, list of statements uh, because these are statements uh, saying flat out that uh, Gaza is to be destroyed, is to be made uninhabitable, that there is no distinction between Hamas and the civilians, uh, that everybody is guilty. And uh, no doubt uh, these uh, Israeli leaders would like to walk back what they said, uh, because what they said was flat out, unbelievably uh, ugly and destructive. And uh, I think South Africa makes a compelling case uh, expressive of genocidal intent. So to watch this in a body of law rather than in the spin of, uh, say, a White House briefing or uh, a, uh, somebody just brushing this aside as uh, John Kirby did when he said, well, this is a bunch of nonsense. The United States uh, you know, rejects all of this as nonsense or the president of Israel is saying this is a blood libel. But to hear it spelled out methodically, uh, hour after hour in precise judicial proceedings is... I think a historic day because Israel is uh, 
being examined closely for what it has said and what it is doing. And this is, to my mind, the highest responsibility and application of the concept of international law. So I think it's a very big day. The, the, the law is very clear, and so our listeners know why you dwelt uh, extensively uh, on intent and why the uh, document itself quotes at length statements from Prime Minister Netanyahu and from uh, many, many people in the Israeli government who pulled the levers of power and the things they said were utterly repellent. You seem to have paused for a second trying to find an adjective horrific enough to describe yeah. what they said, but things like burn them alive, bury them alive, they're subhuman. How do you characterize that? What kind of a mind can justify that kind of slaughter of innocence? But to my point, the law requires that the applicant here, South Africa, show not only that genocide took place, but that it wasn't an accident, that it was intentional. And when you can use, I can tell you this from my prior life on the bench, when you can use the words of your adversary to prove your case, that is the most compelling way to prove your, uh, your case. Let's watch just a minute or so uh, of the initial uh, opening argument this morning. You may have seen this already, uh, Professor Sachs. This is cut 13, Jeff, the opening statement. The violence and the destruction in Palestine and Israel did not begin on the 7th of October, 2023. The Palestinians have experienced systematic oppression and violence for the last 76 years. On 6 October, 2023, and every day since October the 7th, 2023. In the Gaza Strip, at least since 2004, Israel continues to exercise control over the airspace, territorial waters, land crossing, water, electricity, and civilian infrastructure, as well as over key government functions. No armed attack on a state territory, no matter how serious, even an attack involving atrocity crimes, can provide any justification for or defense to breaches to the convention, whether as a matter of law or morality. Israel's response to the 7th of October 2023 attack has crossed this line. S clip, just for those unfamiliar with this kind of a court proceeding, the very end of the clip, you saw all 15 uh, judges, two judges added to the panel, one from Israel, one from South Africa, the other 13 uh, are permanent. It's interesting, I thought of you, Professor Sachs, when I saw the name of the person was added, and I saw um, uh, the last name Barack, and I thought, oh my God, this is the former prime minister and former general, but it's not. It's the former chief justice of the uh, Israeli Supreme Court, a uh, opponent of Prime Minister Netanyahu, whom the Israeli government designated. He's 87 years old, but he's the grand old man, if you will, of uh, Israel law and judiciary, universally respected, and they designated him. I want you to see one more argument before you uh, weigh in, and this is the argument of another lawyer for South Africa who shows a video, and I want you to be able to assess the significance of the video that he shows. Chris? On 7 December 2023, Israeli soldiers proved that they understood the Prime Minister, Minister's message to remember what the Amalek has done to you as genocider. They were recorded by journalists dancing and singing. We know our motto, there are no uninvolved, that they obey one commandment, to wipe off the seed of Amalek. The Prime Minister's invocation of Amalek is being used by soldiers to justify the killing of civilians, including children. These are the soldiers repeating the inciting words of their Prime Minister. <laughs> Oh, 
All right, uh, let's start at the end. What is the significance of Israeli soldiers in Gaza dancing uh, and chanting? Uh, we come to address Amalek. Well, there is a, uh, a very important uh, subtext to all of this, which is uh, the use of biblical symbology and uh, biblical and religious beliefs that are part of uh, Israel's rhetoric and core to Israel's politics. Uh, Amalek is a, a, a part of the Bible uh, when uh, the Israelites uh, are instructed uh, by God to kill all of this nation. And it is one of many genocides, in fact, uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, the book of Joshua, which is the uh, part of the Bible, the sixth the book of the Old Testament, uh, in which the Israelites, after having escaped from uh, Egypt, uh, in the exodus from Egypt, arrive at uh, their promised land and are instructed by God, according to the book of Joshua, to uh, not only take the land, but to kill every man, woman, and child in the land that they are to take. And uh, it's very clear uh, repeatedly from one nation to the next in the book of Joshua that this is to be a genocide that no one shall survive. Now, uh, fast forward uh, 2,600 years, and this text, these texts are being referred to explicitly by the prime minister, by the Israel Defense Forces, and by a large part of the, the Israeli politics, uh, much of which reflects a religious zealotry uh, that takes the Bible as the literal basis for action. And the Bible has in these texts the instructions for genocide, for killing everybody. Mm. And we hear this echo uh, not only in the video that the uh, South African lawyer showed, but uh, in a shocking compilation of uh, videos that uh, Gray Zone uh, produced. Uh, Max Blumenthal, the investigative reporter, produced, released, and posted on uh, Gray Zone uh, a compilation that is filled one after another with this uh, biblical reference, this uh, genocidal fever, uh, and uh, the chanting and delight at the destruction of everybody. So what we're seeing here is a mix of uh, military brutality, religious zealotry, political manipulation in a concoction that is extraordinary. Uh, I think it is so foreign to our eyes to see this, but in the court to have it laid out so explicitly and the court is a, a place of decorum. Uh, you saw the lawyer, how uh, dignified and eloquent he was. I listened to much of his presentation earlier in the day, and the room was silent, listening, having to absorb this direct evidence, not having the ever-present and, for me, utterly disgusting spin from the White House newsroom or uh, some other spin, but actually listening to the realities, grim realities laid out one by one. That's why I think this was a historic day. Here's uh, what the White House actually had to say about it. This is, I think you've seen this and I know you won't be happy and neither am I, but we have to expose this stuff. Here's uh, Admiral uh, Kirby expressing the White House's opinion on the this is three or four days ago, so this is before the oral argument uh, on the application, the 84 page complaint uh, filed by South Africa. South Africa's filed this 84 page lawsuit against Israel, accusing them of genocide. Israel says that this is blood libel. Does Washington agree? And where does this put Washington and Pretoria? We interest find this uh, submission meritless, counterproductive, and uh, completely without any basis in fact whatsoever.
I guess he didn't read it if he finds it meritless, counterproductive, and completely without uh, any basis in fact. And I guess Washington is the only country in the world willing to make a statement as outrageous as that. You know, I, I find him insufferable day by day. <laughs> I do uh, know that. <laughs> yes, you know, I, I don't, don't, don't exactly hide it because I just wish there were grown-ups in power grown-ups who were responsible, who were honest, who were decent, who would read an 84-page detailed complaint and give a serious answer rather than a one-sentence smack-off like that. I wish at the same time that the White House press corps would follow up more seriously. Actually, if I remember correctly, that question uh, started uh, with a few words, just a quick one. Right. And then the question was asked, and Kirby responded in this utterly disgusting way when the most important issue on the planet is in front of him and couldn't do more than one dismissive, phony, and false statement. But then there's no follow-up. Then they move yeah. on to the next topic and the I next think, topic. I sometimes this, think those questions are staged, Jeff, and it's terrible. It's terrible for the American public, and it's demeaning to the profession of journalism. Um, yes. How extreme. could the journalist say, Mr. Kirby, it's 84 detailed pages, and you say there's no factual basis? Why don't we look at page 10? Why don't right. we look at page 12? Why don't the journalists do their job? Right. Rather than feeding us the propaganda from the White House, they should be questioning the propaganda. That's why I was grateful for today's court proceedings, yeah. because yeah. there were hours to put forward the evidence. There is a detailed legal complaint. There are dozens of countries that have supported this. But the U.S. government is all spin all propaganda, uh, and all attempt at narrative control. And uh, Judge Napolitano, that's why you're doing such a service, because you're bringing these issues to the public attention and to the world attention. But the press that's in that room doesn't even follow up with the right. state, uh, another question. Right. Your, your criticism of the press is uh, right on. I want to mention something. You mentioned uh, Max Blumenthal, uh, who's my friend and who uh, regularly appears on the show yesterday on the show. He challenged Bobby Kennedy to a debate on Israel, and I offered to moderate the debate. Now, that's out there. Chris tells me it was, uh, it was tossed about in Twitter or X, whatever they call themselves now, last night. So I hope that uh, comes to pass, I would imagine, uh, the audience would be huge. It would be difficult for me to be perfectly neutral because uh, I can see with my own eyes what's happening. But if I uh, am privileged to moderate that debate, I will be neutral. What defense should we expect tomorrow? Today is all uh, opening arguments from the lawyers from South Africa. Tomorrow, the Israeli uh, lawyers, who, by the way, are British barristers, um, take over. What conceivable defense could there be? What mentality of humanity justifies the slaughter of 26,000 people, at most 3,000 of whom uh, were soldiers? Well, they're going to say that this is in self-defense, that a terrible uh, terrorist attack occurred on October 7, which is true. But as the South African prosecutor said today, uh, that is no defense under the Genocide Convention. They're going to say that these statements uh, are uh, aimed at uh, Hamas, their military enemy, not at the civilian population. That is plainly false because the statements are explicit uh, about uh, uh, all of the population. They're going to say that they take exquisite care uh, in protecting the civilians, uh, which is utterly false because they have put a siege on Gaza, stopped the 
food, the water, the fuel, the medical supplies. They are going to say that they are careful in their targeting of Hamas, which is plainly false because 70% of those killed are women and children, and many of the men killed are absolutely not Hamas soldiers. So Israel is going to have a defense of self-defense, but they're going to deny what is plainly in front of the world's eyes, which are genocidal statements that are pervasive and rampant, and actions against the entire civilian population, not at all targeted, at a massive loss of life that is overwhelmingly civilian, and the displacement of two million people, where Hmm. Hamas has perhaps 30,000 fighters. So Israel is going to make a defense of self-defense that is itself not defensible because the plain facts are contrary to what Israel has been saying every day since this invasion into Gaza began. Do you have a a finger on the pulse of how American Jews view the genocide? I mean, I understand Joe Biden is caught in a vice. He's caught between the donor class, the the APAC folks, and younger people that are traditionally Democrats, but who are horrified by the the genocide. So question one is, should the United States be a co-defendant? And then if we come back to the U.S., you know, you uh, live and work at Columbia University, a uh, large uh, Jewish American population in Manhattan. Do you have a finger on the pulse about how they feel? Answer either question in which either uh, order you wish, any order you well, wish. Well, I, I think it's uh, quite clear from the opinion surveys that uh, the broad American public is aghast at what's happening because they're watching, like all of us, day by day, a slaughter of civilians. I think it's clear that there is a generational uh, gradient, as you pointed out, where young people are absolutely uh, defending uh, the uh, Gazan civilian population, whereas older people are tending more towards uh, uh, backing Israel, because that is uh, the way that it has been for decades. But even so, even among older uh, respondents to the opinion surveys, there is a tremendous, tremendous unease. And in the Jewish community, of course, it's very divided. It's divided by age. It's divided by class. It's uh, divided by interest group. Uh, It's divided uh, by uh, different parts of American Jewry from reform to orthodox, but even within Orthodox Jewry, the most religious, there are parts of Orthodox Jewry, uh, notably uh, the uh, Satmar uh, community in Brooklyn, New York, which says that the whole concept of uh, Israel and Zionism was misconceived because in their view it was religiously misconceived. Uh, And uh, of course, other Orthodox Jews take a, a different view. So it's a lot of division. What we don't have is any uh, overwhelming groundswell of support for Israel in this. Quite the contrary. The American people, every time they're asked and have an opportunity to speak, say, cease fire now. Americans do not want to be complicit in this massacre and in this genocide Uh, as uh, South Africa is describing it today in the International Court of Justice. Should the uh, U.S. be a co-defendant, Professor Sachs? Well, the U.S. is going to be a co-defendant in the court of public opinion because the overwhelming understanding of the world is that Israel could not do this from one day to the next without the United States 
active support. And it is active support in one absolutely key way, which is providing the bombs, the munitions, the artillery, the shells that are killing people and that are destroying the hab habitability and the infrastructure and that have displaced nearly the entire population. And so the Americans wring their hands. Uh, Blinken says, we have to take more care of civilians and so forth. But then signs an order that uh, subverts congressional oversight to directly deliver the munitions to Israel, no strings attached, no conditions whatsoever, so that this continues. So America is complicit. And uh, a subtext of this is that America is on trial as well, because America is Israel's sole backer in the military campaign that is underway in Gaza. I want to run uh, two clips for you, both involving someone you and I know and whose work we admire, Medea Benjamin, who is an American Jew. Uh, uh, also someone you and I know, Congressman Jamie Raskin. In the first clip, Congressman Raskin is giving a speech condemning authoritarian governments outside the Capitol. Watch what happens to Medea while she is silently standing there. And then we'll go right into the second clip, uh, which is a few days later. Medea is in the hallways of the Senate, and she approaches two senators, Rick Scott uh, of Florida and John Cornyn of Texas. It's very interesting to hear what Scott and Cornyn say to her because it's based on uh, the Israeli propaganda. So first with Jamie Raskin and then with the two senators. The political scientists tell us that the hallmarks of an authoritarian or fascist political party are that one, they do not accept the results of democratic elections that don't go their way. Two, they refuse to renounce or they openly embrace political violence as an instrument. What's the matter with this? Something wrong with the scientists? Well, not about the law. They hold Israel accountable. They accept. They, they are worse than Jan Six. Hold Israel accountable. Israel is not about the law. They, they accept. I'm sorry. Let me let me just start that again. They beheaded babies. They, no, they raped did young not. Girls. They did not. That's just propaganda to keep this so war going. It's really, a genocide. We need a ceasefire. Will you please call for a ceasefire? You're going to get Hamas to quit shooting innocent civilians? Well, it's the Israeli bombs that are killing thousands and thousands of people, including children and women. Everything. Spoken like Senator Scott and Senator Cornyn had just come from an APAC meeting. Well, <laughs> you can't make this up that you're having a... Uh, a speech by uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin against authoritarianism and uh, somebody peacefully holding up a sign is pulled away by the police. It looks like a comedy if it, it were a it tragedy. It looks like, a, like it's a scene from Seinfeld. It, it looks like a, you know, a Saturday Night Live skit, frankly, that uh, <laughs> it, it just is so sad. Now, uh, the senators, this is typical right now. They're arrogant and they're ignorant. And uh, they keep the military industrial complex well fed and the military industrial complex keeps them well fed and in power. So it's a game. They're playing a game. They don't want the American people involved. They don't want to have to answer questions. It's like Kirby. Nobody wants any questions asked. It's all narrative to keep their game going. It's a racket. It's a trillion dollar a year racket. They've got a lot of military arms sales. They like it. It's a, the military industrial industry keeps these people in power. And anyone that is uh, pesky enough to ask a question just is bad behavior because who asked you to ask us? We are the military industrial complex, thank you. It's none of your business. That's the basic message. Professor Sachs from uh, Phnom Penh, Cambodia, thank you very much for uh, joining us, my dear friend.